My 2005 computer still runs on Internet Explorer, so I apologize for being late to the party, but that's beside the point. Apparently, there's a version of Sonic Freeriders where we can use an actual controller in place of our body. And hearing that just got me thinking of one question. Was the original game really that unplayable to the point where the fans had to fix it? Well, the answer to that question is exactly what I set out to do. Today, we're gonna find out if the Kinect was really the problem all along. Is it possible to beat Sonic Freeriders with the Kinect? The goal of this challenge is to, obviously, complete the story mode in the most authentic way possible. So, yes, I will be using the actual hardware for this. Mama did not raise a coward. Whoa, look at that cute six foot four stud. I don't know if you can see it, but I actually have a pair of sunglasses with me to help get into the, uh, writer's vibe. Also remember, 50k and I'll do one for Bubsy 3D. All of the boring intro stuff is out of the way, so now let's begin with... a little bit of training, actually. This is a, this is a very unique experience, so let's quickly go over the fundamentals. There's a lot of things that are pretty self-explanatory, like uh, leaning left or right with our body will have our character turn that way, and jumping in real life will have our character jump in-game. One thing to note about the jump is that it works like how it does in the first Riders game. The longer we hold the button down, or in this case, the longer we crouch, the higher the jump will be when performed on a ramp. Two things will happen from bigger hops. It gives us a better chance at landing on a different route, which is usually more advantageous for us, and it'll fill up our fuel tank more. If we can add a spin to our jump, it'll fill up even more. And we're gonna need as much gas as possible for the most important action, the kick dash. If we lift our leg up, then kick it backwards, we'll give ourselves a small boost. Each time we do this, it depletes a chunk of our fuel. At first glance, it might not seem like much, but executing as many of these as possible will significantly benefit us in the long run. Which is why we need to make these jumps as perfect as we can make them. And before I forget, all of the races begin with everyone behind the starting line for the countdown. We can use our kick dash here, and when timed correctly, we can start off with a little boost if the timer has reached zero before crossing the line. Doing it too early will penalize us, so finding the right timing will obviously be beneficial. There will be a few unique cases where we need to copy whatever is on screen or use our surroundings. Uh, this can range from flailing our arms to swim, levering our hands to steer a minecart, pushing one of our appendages down to make an ink trap, shooting an alley-oop like we're a quarterback from our local hockey team, the list goes on. Just be aware of when they pop up. Also, I've never noticed this before, but we have a very slight delay when executing a few of our actions, likely from the Kinect trying to process our movements. This means we can't ideally make split-second decisions, so all of our actions need to be well thought out and choreographed. It's a little awkward right now, but the more we play, the more we'll become accustomed to it. That is all the basics for the hoverboard, we'll go over the advanced tech when we come across them. Now that we're all warmed up, let's take a crack at the first chapter of the campaign, starring Team Heroes. Every chapter contains a handful of missions, each with their own different objective. Mission 1 starts us off with a simple one-lap race in Dolphin Resort. All we need to do is finish in the top three in order to move on. It would be in our best interest to learn the layouts of all the tracks. Uh, knowing where all the boost panels and the shortcuts are is going to save our hides in some of these races. Like right here, if we take the higher routes and crouch for a second jump, some dolphins will smack us all the way across to the other end of the straightaway, which helps us land in first place and gives us an S rank. You know, that wasn't too hard for a first try. Let's double down on this challenge and aim for all S ranks. I believe in us, I think we can do this. Mission 2 is to collect at least 100 rings. These are scattered all around the course. Most are in plain sight, others will be hidden in the decor, but the real money bags are located in the sky. If we jump off the ramps well enough, we'll be able to add them to our savings account. Just be aware that these ring challenges will not end after completing a lap. Rather, it's based on the timer, 
so we can come back for a second round and pick up any loose change we may have forgotten. Mission 3, grind 3 or more times before crossing the finish line. Compared to the previous two titles, grinding was heavily simplified. In order to access the railing, just steer Sonic close enough to it and he'll automatically clip onto it. We can also change railings by jumping. Grinding, along with flying and smashing, will not only fill up our tank, but will also give us better times in races, so it's good to pay attention to where they're located. Know which character has which ability to know which route to take. These were all in plain sight for this challenge, so no trouble here. Mission 4, get 14 or more points from doing tricks. The higher the rank, the more points we get. This new track, Frozen Forest, gives us plenty of ramps and introduces us to half pipes. If we know how to charge our jumps, then this will be a piece of cake. Mission 5, destroy at least 5 ice clusters and fossils. Having this power ability equipped it will allow us to break certain objects. Simply punch towards the screen to send out an aura sphere to demolish whatever's in front of us. Just know where they're all located to obtain the S rank. Mission 6 is to come in first in a one lap race. With Sonic in command, there are two notable grind rails we can use. One at the very beginning, and the second can be accessed by half-piping on this skeleton's ribcage. Make sure he's nice and balanced on there. Although he can't fall off, he'll lose speed if he's wobbly. Also, this track ends with us riding a bobsled. There are trails of rings that sometimes lead to boost panels in this tunnel, so of course we're gonna be using them. Mission 7, get 12 or more points from doing tricks. In Magma Rift, all of the half-pipes and ramps were in plain sight. Also, weird thing that I found. If we do a trick on a half-pipe and land on the same half-pipe, we can jump again to perform another trick. Logically, it makes no sense. Personally, I love it. Mission 8, fly through at least 12 dash rings. You're not gonna believe this, but once we launch ourselves off this special ramp, we can fly by T-posing. There will be a few moments where we have to drop our hands to descend, and unsurprisingly, we still pass our pilot's test. Mission 9 is another one-lap race. Jumping at the end of this bridge will take us to the faster route above, and shortly after that is a moment where our screen gets covered in steam. We have to wipe our hands around to clear our vision. Pretty straightforward stuff. And Mission 10 is a rival duel. So every chapter ends with a three-lap race. Our opponent slash opponents during these clashes will be a little bit smarter than the average freeriders racer, so our mistakes need to be minimized. Uh, uh, granted, with how simplistic Magma Rift's layout is, that wasn't really a problem. Uh, grind on the rails whenever they come up, uh, kick dash during straightaways, and use the bridge shortcut from the last mission. Also, instead of using the half-pipe here, we can save a little bit of time by making this sharp turn in front of it. Avoiding it completely won't waste our time in the air. Winning this race concludes Team Hero's story, and unlocks the next chapter with Team Babylon. Their first mission starts us off with another one-lap race. The goal is to place in the top three. This new track, Rocky Ridge, has that minecart gimmick I mentioned earlier, steer clear of all the bold ears to maintain our speed. That's kind of it. Mission 2 is an interesting one. We have to maintain a top speed of 135 or higher and pass through all the checkpoints. There are plenty of boost panels to help us out, and we still have our trusty kick dash if things get sticky. Two things to be aware of are that turning and crouching down for a jump lowers our speed, so pay extra attention to that number in the bottom right corner. Mission 3, collect at least 60 rings. Surprisingly, the big bucks were all on the ground. Easy peasy. Mission 4, grind three or more times. Now in Metropolis Highway, make a big enough jump on this first one, then just don't mess up any of the other jumps. Lemon squeezy. Mission 5, maintain a top speed of 135 or higher. This track has 90 degree turns and multiple alternate routes to take that lead us down thin corridors. Try not to commit too much when turning and make sure not to bump into any walls. When in doubt, kick dash. Mission 6, place first in a one lap race. Once the track opens up, there will be a grind rail on the left hand side, so direct jet over that way to make use of- I'm sorry, what? 
Right! Okay, so, in Free Riders, we can equip two gear parts to our extreme gear. The way we can toggle through them is by changing which way our body is facing. Which one is designated to our left and right side is determined by the character's stance. When skateboarding, and in this case, hoverboarding, we have two different stances. Regular, which is left foot in front, and Goofy, which is right foot in front. Everyone who rides a board in this game uses one of these two as their default stance. Team Heroes does it with regular, but the Babylon Rogues go goofy. I use regular, so there were no complications with Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles. However, Jet, Wave, and Storm have to change their original stance to match me, which deactivates the gear part in the races. So in order for us to actually use it, we need to change our stance to Goofy to match the birds. Regular is what we will still be racing in, but when the time comes, we will switch to Goofy just to use our ability, like how you just saw me do right here. Then we'll change back to what's comfortable. Anyway, the mission. Use the grind rail to get to this big ramp quicker. Once we make a jump onto this massive subway, put your hands in the air to grab hold of the other subway to take an alternate route. Keep hold of it until they kick us off, then immediately hold out the right hand to spin around this lamppost. It'll take us down an alley where there is another lamppost on the left side. Following these steps will reward us with an easy victory. Mission 7, destroy at least 12 relics in Forgotten Tomb. This was about as difficult as taking some bacon and putting it in a pancake. Mission 8, collect at least 150 rings. In addition to making good jumps, there is also an emphasis for using our arms. We can collect some golden goodies if we reach our hands out to the side and straight up in the air. Mission 9, place first in a one lap race. This track is pretty straightforward, so basically just follow the blue signs. The second grind rail leads to a path where we can use a vertical pole to zoom us down another path. And we can do that again shortly after to be optimal with our time. Also, about halfway through, a pillar will collapse on the raceway, so we have to crouch in order to get past it, and we have to keep that crouch until we reach a little incline to jump onto the railing that I just mentioned. With all these in mind, our opponents will be left in the dust. I, uh, I can say the exact same things for Mission 10, so no need to sound like a broken record. The Babylon story is wrapped up, so now begins the next chapter with Team Dark. Just a heads up, both Rouge and Shadow use the Goofy stance, so if there is a moment where we have to change to their default stance, then of course we shall if we need to. Mission 1, place within the top 3 in the Frozen Forest Expert Course. While Expert Courses have different layouts, they usually attain the same gimmicks and even reuse a few sections from their normal counterparts. This one, however, feels like the original course except longer, so we really don't have a reason to discuss it. Uh, just be sure to collect as many rings as possible during these racing challenges, as gathering enough will slightly increase our stats during the duration. Mission 2 is a new one. Pass through a number of gates within the time limit. We can't utilize any shortcuts during this objective, so dash panels and kick dashing are must in order to make it around the whole map. Mission 3 is another new one. Shoot down at least three rivals before crossing the finish line. This straight up boils down to opening an item capsule and throwing a missile as soon as we can. Interestingly enough, our fuel gauge doesn't deplete during this kind of objective, so we can spam the kick dash to our heart's content. Mission 4, fly through at least 10 dash rings in Dolphin Resort's expert course. I want to fly high So I can reach the highest of all the heavens Okay, hearing that back, I think I'll actually give myself a 6 out of 10 for that performance. It, it actually did not sound like complete dog sh**. Mission 5, shoot down at least three rivals before crossing the finish line. You know, if you think about it, this one is a very subtle but deep metaphor. Uh, try seeing it through my eyes. The robots symbolically represent you, the viewer, and how he's bombarding the other racers is like how you're clicking the like and subscribe. Mission 6, beat Sonic to the goal. Blue signs and kick dash. Also exclusive to this map is a wakeboarding section. With our hands, we can maneuver ourselves over to the buoyant ramps and jump off them to give us an extra boost. 
Mission 7. Get 23 or more points from performing tricks in Forgotten Tomb's expert course. I'm just saying, if Tony Hawk saw this, he would be quite proud of us. Mission 8. Pass through each gate within the time limit. This course has a few more surprises compared to the original track. Like, barely five seconds in and the walls start to crumble, forcing us to crouch underneath it, which is immediately followed by a horizontal bar we can grab hold of to fling ourselves on the top route. Follow this route to the outside and we'll find a fork in the road. Take the path to the right, as it's shorter and has more dash panels. If we keep up with the kick dashing, we should have about 10 seconds to spare with each gate. Mission 9, grind five or more times. I'll, I'll admit the timing to switch between the vines is a little bit strict, but learning from our mistakes will allow us to complete it. And Mission 10, the three lap race. Follow the tips I mentioned for the eighth mission. However, be careful with the outside portion because it might actually change between laps. The first time we exit the temple, there will be a speed sign to the left and a fly sign to the right. Coming back to this part in lap 2 might keep everything the same. Uh, for this run, lap 2 had a different layout from lap 1. The left path is now empty, and the right one is now designated to Power Racers. And the change stayed for the third lap. Oh, well, I guess that means we stay to the left for all of them. Alright, cool. Once we obliterate the competition, we move on to the penultimate chapter with Team Rose. Mission 1, place within the top three in Rocky Ridge's expert course. This was like taking candy from a baby, which is fine by me. Mission 2, assert dominance for one minute. Mission 3, maintain a top speed of 140 or more. Oh, that's right, uh, we can also ride bikes in this game. For this mode of transportation, we are spared from scoliosis as our hands do most of the dirty work. Face forwards and have both hands in front as if we're riding a real bike. Bring the left one down to veer left, bring the right one down to veer right, bring both hands down to charge for a jump, and then raise them up to jump. Controlling the bike is much more, uh, I think the word I'm looking for is sensitive because the Kinect is focusing on two things for turning. It's loose and fiddly, but if we slash the Kinect don't make any grave mistakes, we should be in the clear. Mission 4 is an air limit challenge in Metropolis Highway's expert course. This is a glorified way to say reach the goal without running out of gas. After the 90 degree turn, stay to the far left or the far right. There's a ramp coming up and jumping in those positions will grant us access to the higher routes which is filled to the brim with even more ramps to fill our tank. Mission 5, collect at least 200 rings. Cool, laughing all the way to the bank. Mission 6, place first in a one lap race. After this first half pipe, quickly meander over to the left side and raise our hands up to vault us on these iron grates above us, then immediately hold out our right hand to swing around this upcoming lamppost. Keep hugging the left wall because there's another horizontal bar we can use to fling ourselves directly into a set of boost panels. Doing all of these will secure a winning placement. Mission 7, smash 10 or more boulders in Magma Rift's expert course. Oh, oh, this one, this one was super dumb. It would be much more doable on the hoverboard, but Vector is assigned to only use the bike. In this scenario, turning and punching are both mapped to our hands, so the Kinect has a very difficult time registering when we want to attack. Also, from what I know, we're not allowed to attack while we're turning, so we need to be aligned with the object well before we get to it, which is easier said than done, especially with how delicate the bike controls are. I'm sure you can see Vector jittering on screen. That That is not me purposefully making it look bad, that is literally what we're dealing with. Oh, the S rank for this one took an obnoxious amount of tries. Thankfully for us, this is the last mission where we are relegated to the bike. Haha, <laughs> mission 8 was an air limit challenge. With a boatload more halfpipes than the original, we scored some gnarly ollies, Bruski. Mission 9, maintain a top speed of at least 140. Yep. And mission 10, the actual race. It is another certified yep moment casually ending this chapter and unlocking one last chapter, simply titled Final Race. 
which is a bit of a lie because it's three different races. The first of which is a three lap race in a brand new location, Final Factory. Just like the other tracks, it's mainly knowing about the layouts, because this one in particular is chalk filled with phenomenal shortcuts. After this first 90 degree turn, balance on one of these three thin paths, then jump to access the higher route. Now, there's a blue sign to the left, so we're gonna make our way over to that side. However, we're not gonna use the grind skill here, as there is a vertical bar right before it that will bring us down a path that takes us deeper into the track. Keep following wherever the track takes us, and once we go outside, there will be three diverging paths. Take the one in the middle, as it leads to a grind rail that we can utilize. At the very end of the lap is a giant ramp. Charging up a big jump will blast us to the top route. This next sequence needs to be executed flawlessly, as when performed correctly, it shaves off, like, 20 whole seconds, I'm not joking. Staying close to the left wall reveals a set of boost panels leading across a thin walkway. This is followed by two horizontal bars, one after the other. Then finishing it off, this wide platform turns into two thin walkways with ramps at the end. Jump correctly. And... With that, we have successfully pulled off probably the biggest shortcut of the whole game. I mean, look at that massive gap between us and second place. It's insane. Uh, Amy? Rouge? Where are y'all going? The second is another three-lap race, now on the expert course. It begins similar to the normal one. A big 90-degree turn, three thin paths, but no shortcut to the left. Cruise along the main route until we see our first blue sign on the left. It'll drop us off in this narrow walkway. The path splits, so quickly weave to the right as it has a glow stick that we can grab on. A few seconds later, we find ourselves in some kind of cannon that launches us into a skydiving section. Just like in real life, have our arms by our side to plummet faster and do the opposite to descend slower. After making this big left turn, a line in the middle path again for the grind rail. Once we get dropped off, we use another glow stick to the right, then make a big jump to the top route above the starting line to again use two horizontal bars and the thin ramps. This time, instead of bringing us down to the main track, it takes us down a much faster route that we would normally only access when using the power ability near the start. Stay close to the right side, as there is a number of conveniently placed poles. Seriously, that is a tremendous lead. Just doing that shortcut once is enough to guarantee a win. And lastly, the big finale is just like the last race, except Metal Sonic is our only opponent. Who, of course, could not keep up with our radical boarding skills because we're just that awesome. Uh, that just about does it. So, yeah, it is possible to beat Sonic Freeriders with the Kinect. In addition to completing the World Grand Prix, we have also S-ranked all of the missions in the campaign. Huh. Well, looky here, we've also acquired every collectible, too. Oh! Wow! Every single achievement has been unlocked. Oh gee, I need a controller to play this game because I don't like getting out of my $200 gaming chair! Thank you all for sticking around for this, uh, silly special. I hope you paid attention to the release date of this video. I also hope you enjoyed it, and maintain a wonderful rest of your day. And now, the Patreon supporters, brought to you by Mod. Father of the Hampton, Page Fighting Master, so dark who fossil and shrift. Gianna Ten March Greek got lots of spaghetti, some filler to fill out the riff.